Okay, so I'm gonna go over some old stuff that we haven't looked at in a while, um, and then probably go to some stuff that's a little bit more kind of close to what we've been looking at in the last couple of weeks. So uh, the very first kind of example we have here is the time spent waiting for a new roller coaster at Six Flags is uniformly distributed between 15 and 75 minutes. So we got this uniformly distributed variable, we know it's minimum and we know it's maximum. So right away when we see a uniformly distributed variable, like I said, this goes back a ways to right after the, the last exam. Let's see if I got it. And that writes a little bit clearer than this. There we go. So I have this random variable x. I know its minimum is 15 and its maximum is 75, right? So the very first question, I think the second question asking me what the mean and the variance of this variable will be. Well, if we want the mean, since everything's equally is weighted, like equally weighted in a uniform distribution, we're really just looking for kind of the middle number here. Well, that's not perfectly drawn to scale, I guess, but maybe like kind of there, like perfectly in the middle between these two values. So if I want to find the middle of two values, or simply take the average, all I'm doing there is adding up my maximum and my minimum values and dividing by two or 75 plus 15 divided by two, I think gives us a mean of 45, okay? So it's as simple as that. Now the variance, probably not quite as, as intuitive, but, and I'll come back to this in a second. Oh, I forgot to open up the formula sheet. Here's our uniform distribution equations, right? So here was our mean equation, which was add up the minimum and the maximum. Remember C here representing, represents uh, our minimum, D represents our maximum. If you want to, print this formula sheet out or open up the word file, maybe type right next to it or write next to it. Instead of C and D, this is the general form, but ahead of time before the exam, you could write, you know, min plus max divided by two, right? The variance isn't quite as intuitive, but it will always follow this formula. So we'll take the range of our uniform distribution, so maximum minus the minimum, square that, and then divide by 12. Okay. So 75 minus 15, so that's 60. Square it, divide by 12. If we do that, I believe you should get 300. Okay. So the variance will be 300. Okay. Now, if I had asked you instead to find the standard deviation, what's the only other step you need to do? simply take the square root, right? So that formula is not technically on the formula sheet, right? But if you can find the variance, you always can find the standard deviation by just taking the square root of it, okay? So those two should be pretty easy. I mean, these should be like on the first exam where I asked you to find the mean. I mean, I can guarantee you I wrote the exam. So you're gonna see, you know, at least this very first question that looks very similar to this. And finding the mean of the uniform distribution is simply add the minimum and the maximum, divide by two. The variance, I mean, once you have identified that these are your uniform distribution equations, it's just a matter of plugging your minimum and your maximum. So max minus min, getting that, okay? If instead I wanted the probability that a person is waiting in line for a roller coaster for more than 50 minutes, all right? So this is where we have to think all right, I want to know, and it kind of helps uh, to plot the mean, and I try to make this more of a dashed line here so it doesn't, okay? Just to kind of know where the mean is at, because even for a uniform distribution, because it's symmetric, I know that the probability I see something below the mean or the probability I see something above the mean, those are both 0.5, right? Just exactly like the normal distribution, the mean splits it in half, right? So if I want the probability that somebody waits in line for more than, 50 minutes, what I'm really thinking about is this area right here. So right away, I know it has to be less than 0.5 because the area to the right of the mean would have been 0.5. 50 is kind of you know, a little bit above the mean. So that area to the right of that has to be a little bit less than 0.5. So if I'm just thinking about what answers I can rule out, if I look at this, do I have to do any more work here? No. Right? Or sorry, yes, yes, sorry. I just did a little more work. Because it's less than 0.5. I didn't see the one value. I can cross out B, I can cross out A. It's going to be in between C and D. Right? So it's going to be a little bit less than 0.5. So it's going to be one of these two answers. Now, 
if I kind of look at it, if I'm trying to guess in between C and D, D is probably a more likely answer just because that value of 50 was pretty close to my mean. But let's make sure, you know, let's not just kind of guess here. Let's actually walk through and make sure that in fact, the area to the right of that is 0.42. So one thing that we had talked about was that the height of this uniform distribution is one over D minus C or one over the maximum minus the minimum. So if I wanna find the area of a rectangle, what do I do? I take the height, multiply it by kind of the, the base or the width. So here, I'm gonna have what? One over 75 minus 15 or one over 60. So my height is one over 60. What's the width? Well, my maximum 75 and I wanna start at 50. It's just the difference between those two values, right? What's the length here? 75 minus 50. So I've got 25 over 60, which I think if we kind of get, put it into that, our calculators, we should get 0.42. Okay. Oh yeah. If we round to the second decimal, I guess if we're gonna be real specific here, 0.4166 repeated, right? But the answers were displayed to two decimals. So kind of round to whatever, whatever value the answers are displaying. Okay. Any questions on that? Yeah. Um, would that be the same process if you were looking at something the opposite side? Yep, so let's say I wanted a problem that's less than 50. Mm -hmm. I would still think about, here's 50, I want the area to the left. I have the same height, right? That isn't so one over 60, but now the width would be 15 to 50, so 50 minus 15, right? Yeah, same exact process. So the uniform distribution, it doesn't matter which side we're looking at, because we're really just kind of thinking about finding the area of a rectangle. It gets more complicated with the standard normal because we, we kind of have this normal distribution um, has kind of a, a crazier PDF. In fact, we don't want to think about this as the area of a rectangle. Technically, right, this is our probability density function to find the probability of being in between any two values. But notice B and A, those were just kind of like the start and stop of my interval. And D and C were my minimum, minimum and my maximum. So when I was multiplying by the height of my distribution, what I was really multiplying by was one over D minus C, which if I multiply by one over something, it's really just the same as dividing by whatever's in the denominator. So if you wanna, you know, just, you know, think, you can use that density function and plug the values in there to, to get that 0.42. But I think it's easier to draw it out and kind of think about, okay, the height of my distribution will always be one over the maximum minus the minimum. I can then find the area of a rectangle by taking the height and multiplying it by kind of the base or the, the width of that, of that Rectangle. Okay. Yep. So, what if it's the next question? I think. What's the problem that somebody waits between thirty and forty-five minutes? Okay. So we've got the same sort of setup. So I'll just kind of clean up my my board work here a little bit. So I've got what did I want? Between 30 and 45, was it? So I want this area. Okay. So the height of my distribution was still 1 over 60. It's really the same process, right? I'll take the height of that distribution, 1 over 60, multiply it by the length of my interval, 45 minus 30. If I do that, I get, what, 15 over 60, which should be 0.25. So kind of a, just another example, it's a little bit, I don't know, just diff different numbers. Um, but if I had thought about this, and I didn't draw us a scale very well, but 
Remember, 45 was our mean, so automatically I know this value had to be less than 0.5, right? Because the area to the left and the right of the mean was 0.5. So if I look at my possible answers here, which of these are less than 0.5? Only C and D. Right? So once again, I could rule out two of the answers right away. Also, I'm working off practice exam B. I think I forgot to mention that at the, at the beginning, but I'm working off practice exam B here. Okay. Now, what if instead I had said, what's the probability? I need a little bit more room here, so I'm going to draw this out here. What if I instead said, what's the probability between 30 and 45 or between 40 and 65, right? So now I kind of want this total area. Well, if the probability that's between 30 and 45 was 0.25, what's the probability that's in between 50 and 65? Well, it's the same height. What's the length of this interval? 15, the length of this one is 15. So this should be an area of 0.25 as well. So if I add those up, then I would have kind of a total probability of 0.5 there. So I might do something like that where I kind of ask you what's the probability area in between these two ranges. Usually if I'm doing that, pay attention to what the interval lengths are. If they're the same, then they're gonna have the same probability of occurring for uniform distribution. Any questions on that one? Okay, so that shouldn't be too bad. So hopefully these will be some, you know, these first few problems, I know it's kind of going back a ways, but once you kind of familiarize yourself with these, should be some, some easier points, I think, on these first few problems. We're really gonna skip around, go down quite a bit. Um, we'll do this one then. We'll do, uh, we'll do start with 14, okay? So we have the IQ of Ball State students is normally distributed with a population standard deviation of 15. We take us actually, yeah, okay, we'll do this one. We take a sample of 49 students and find they have a sample mean of 109, sample mean IQ, right? So we've got, a known population standard deviation, but only we have a sample mean. So should I use the student T or the standard normal distribution if I'm trying to find confidence intervals for this, for this hypothesis test? Well, if I have a known population standard deviation, this is where I can use the standard normal because I have a known population variance. So what this question is getting at, maybe one, one way to organize this as you're going into the exam, I know sometimes it's, it's kind of tough to know which distribution do I need to use in what types of scenarios. So if I have a known population standard deviation or I'm looking at examples where I have a sample proportion, that's when I'm going to be using those standard normal or those Z tables. Okay. If I'm dealing with a sample mean and all I have is a sample variance or a known population standard deviation, this is a scenario where I need to use that student T distribution. Okay? So in this problem, we had a known population variance or a known population standard deviation, so we can use that standard normal distribution. All right? Um, another kind of reminder of this is if we look at the formula sheet, right? Here we've got our confidence interval equations, and it kind of reminds us, if you have a sample mean where you know the population variance or standard deviation, you can use, you need to look at a standard normal or get the Z tables. If I have a proportion example, use the Z tables. If I have a sample mean with only a sample variance or sample standard deviation, use those student T tables. Same kind of thing, the test statistics, it reminds us that for proportions, and means where we know the population variance, we can use the standard normal distribution. So we have a Z statistic for our test statistic. And if you only have the sample variance, then you need to use that student T distribution and you'll have a T statistic. So the formula sheet kind of reminds us of that, but we look at the confidence intervals. That's what the, I think, next question asks us. So we've identified, we use the standard normal because we know the population variance, right? If I want to build a 90% confidence interval, 
for where the true mean IQ is, what, what would it be? So I go to my formula sheet. Here's my confidence interval equations. I have a sample mean where I know the population variance or standard deviation. So I'm going to use this guy right here. Okay. I wanted the 90% level. So my alpha is going to be what? Remember, out, yeah, 0 0.1. It's just the area outside my confidence interval in decimal form. So I'll divide it by 2, right? Alpha over 2. So I have alpha total outside my interval or alpha over 2 on each side. So 0 0.1 divided by 2 is 0 0.05. So let's go to my Z tables. I know the area I want in my tail is 0 0.05. So I'm gonna to try to find that in the middle here. It looks like it's in between these two values. So negative 1.64 and negative 1.65, okay? So I'm thinking about this. I've got, I identified the formula I wanted, no, sorry. I identified the formula that I wanted here. So I'll plug in that one point. I found negative 1.65, but remember, that's already built into the kind of lower and upper bound. We want to go 1.65 standard, standard deviations below to get our lower bound, 1.65 standard deviations above to get our upper bound. Was it 107, did I say was the sample? I can't remember now. 109 and a standard deviation of 15 from 49 students. So this was what, 109 times, here my sample size was uh, 49 and the variance was, or the standard deviation was 15. But notice, if I'm plugging in my standard deviation here, my standard deviation is just sigma. So when I plug 15 in, I still need to square it, right? So if you're given the standard deviation, when you're plugging it into that confidence interval equation, that wants the variance. So if all you have is the standard deviation, you still need to square that to get the variance. Right? So if we go ahead and compute this. Uh, 15 squared. So 105.46 approximately would be our kind of lower bound. Now, in these examples, when you're asked for a confidence interval, just for the sake of time on these, you know, um, as you're going through the exam, notice none of the lower bounds are the same. So once you kind of find what that is, you can identify what the, the right answer is. So we found what, 104.5, or sorry, 105.46. I might be a little bit off here because I think what I ended up doing when I calculated these was I used this last row of the student T table. Remember, it gave me the values that I would find from a standard normal distribution just out to the third decimal. So now if I look up 0 0.05 that I want, alpha over two was 0 0.05. I can get a little bit more specific, so 1.645, right? So if I plug in 1.645 instead of 1.65, kind of rounding to the second decimal, I'll get something that's like off to the, you know, off a little bit at the second decimal point. But I'll never kind of give you two answers that are like so close that, you know, if you took it out to the third decimal or the second decimal, it'd be kind of way off. So with these confidence interval ones, you know, it might be a little bit off to the second or third decimal, depending on if you just get the second decimal from the standard normal distribution or you use that last row of the student T to be able to get out to kind of that, that third decimal. Right? Does that make sense, what I was saying there? Okay. Um, so we had that lower bound of 105.46-ish or seven if I take it out to the, that third decimal. So I don't even have to find the upper bound here. I know this is gonna be be the answer. Now I could go ahead if I want to double check and I have enough time, you know, it's the exact same equation, but instead of subtracting this margin of error, I would be adding that margin of error, right? Okay. Any questions on that before we keep moving? All right. Uh, so 
And there's something else I want to point out there. I don't, let me see this real quick. I don't think so. So in this example, there's nothing we can rule out. But if we remember what we're doing with confidence intervals, we're taking 109 and we're building a confidence interval around it. So it should be exactly in the middle of the two values that we find. So if, for example, I don't know, let's say, let's say this one, we had an answer like that. You automatically know that that couldn't be the right answer because 109 isn't even in that range, right? In this case, we don't have any that are like that. In fact, I believe, you know, it's, it's exactly in the middle of all these, so we can't really rule anything out in this one right away. All right, so let's use this same kind of data and say that we want to test for whether or not the average IQ of a Ball State student is different than the national average of 105. So we want to test for whether or not the, the average IQ is different than 105. So what you want to test for is your alternative hypothesis, right? Whatever you're trying to find, that's your alternative hypothesis. So I want to know, is it different than 105 or is it Oops, not equal to 105, All right? Different than 105, is it not equal to 105? That's kind of the mathematical translation of, of English there, right? So that's my alternative hypothesis. I assume the opposite is true for my null, which is that it is equal to 105, okay? So here is gonna be my null alternative hypothesis. Now, one thing not to get, you know, not to, to kind of, you don't wanna mix these up, your sample mean should never be the value in your null and alternative hypothesis. I mean, first of all, it'd be very unlikely. It's almost like, uh, well, I'm gonna assume it's equal to 105. And then lo and behold, I find it's 105. You know, it's like, it's a little fishy, right? Um, it's very unlikely, almost impossible, right? That whatever you, your assumption is, you see that from your sample, right? The whole thing is you're trying to use your sample to say, is this an invalid assumption, right? So usually it's gonna be some type of test you wanna do against some media reported value or you know, a national average like in this example. So we wanna know is it different than or not equal to 105, so we assume the opposite is true. So what type of tailed test do I have here? Two tailed tests, right? Not equal to sign means that evidence on either side could go against the null. If I see 109, that goes against my null hypothesis. If I see 99, that also goes against my assumption. Right? So I've got this two-tailed test. So on 17, when I'm asking for the critical values, right away I know what are the only possible answers here. If I have a two-tailed test, yeah, B or D, because for a two-tailed test, I don't just have a critical value at each one of these alphas, I have pairs of critical values, right? So for a two-tailed test, when I'm thinking about finding these critical values, which, right, we have that known standard deviation, so we're still using that standard normal. I'm trying to find the value that gives me alpha total in the tails, if, sorry, I'll write it this way. Alpha total in my tail if I only have one tail, but in my tails if I do have two tails, right? So here I do have two tails, so I'm actually going to need a pair of critical values. So let's say alpha was 0.1, then the area in each of my tails I have two equally sized tails, it would be alpha over two or 0 0.05. So if I want 0 0.05 in this kind of lower left tail for a two tail test, I can find that critical value by going to my standard normal table, looking up the area I want in the tail of 0 0.05, get pretty close here, so negative 1.6, Four in between negative 1.64 and 1.65. So my critical value there would be positive 0.0.
and negative 1.65. And that's just for the alpha of 0.1, right? Or a significance level of 10%. I could then look up the next critical value, right? For an alpha of, do a different color then. For an alpha of 0 0.05. So I'm gonna critical value here now, critical value over here now. That gives me 0 0.05 over two or 0 0.025 in each tail. I then go to the table, look up 0 0.025, find that, that critical value, right? If I do that, I think it's like, it's gonna be negative 1.96 and positive 1.96, right? Now my rejection regions, if I wanna think about kind of completing it after this, this problem would be somewhere, anything that's more extreme than those critical values. We're kind of drawing those arrows into the tail. Now, an easier way to probably do this, and this is where we want to get comfortable using that last row of the student T table, is, well, look, if I know that I want an alpha of, oops, if I want an alpha of 0 0.1, 0 0.05, and 0 0.01 for a two-tailed test, I'm going to have to divide those all by two because they're getting split up into two tails, right? That's kind of what we were doing up here. So instead of out, instead of looking up the values of 0 0.1, 0 0.05, and 0 0.01, that's the total area in my tails, but when I'm just looking at one tail, those are actually 0 0.05, 0 0.025, and 0 0.005. Because alpha is the total area in my tails, and I have two tails, so it's getting split into two. So I'll look those three values up, the area I want in one tail, right? So 0 0.05, 0 0.025, and 0 0.005. Now, I was using that standard normal distribution, but I'm gonna use this student T table, and I can find them all pretty quick. So I have these three columns. If I go to my last row, remember that last row represents the standard normal distribution values. So 1.645, 1.96, and 2.576, right? So those are gonna be my critical values, but I'm gonna have pairs of them, well, right, right here. Because for a two-tailed test, kind of both, both tails matter. Right? So here my answer is gonna be B, right? Finding the critical values at each of these three levels, I'm gonna have a pair at each level for a two-tailed test, okay? Any questions over that? Okay with that? Okay. So those are our three critical values, right? The next question is kind of what's your test statistic? Right? So we go to our formula sheet. We know that here's our three different test statistic equations. We have an example where we know the sample mean and we have a population standard deviation, okay? So we'll just plug our values in there. So our, so we've got what? Um, sorry. So we had 109, 105 was the assumed true value. The standard deviation is 15. So just like with the confidence interval, we need to make sure that we square that. And then our sample size, I think was 49. Right. So what does that end up being? Uh, about 1.86. So if I think about, so I'll wait a second if you're kind of writing this down. So I wrote too big. So let's say we try to draw what we have here. Just gonna get rid of this for a second. So I'm looking at my sample means, normally distributed around the assumed true value of 105. I found 109. So if I want to find the p value, right? Using that, you know, I have my test statistic now. Sorry, before I go to the p-value, 
Uh, one thing I did want to mention as well. If I see something that's above, right, my sample evidence is above the assumed true value, I know my test statistic is going to be positive, or that Z statistic will be positive. Why is that the case? Well, if I think about what I have here in the denominator, this represents the standard deviation of my sample means. All of these test statistic equations, the, de the denominator is a standard deviation of whatever statistic you're looking at. So variances and standard deviations are always positive. So if I see a sample mean that's above the assumed true mean, I always know I'll end up with a positive test statistic, which makes sense because the assumed true mean would have a test statistic of zero, right? So anything above that assumed true mean as a positive test statistic, anything below that, we end up with a negative test statistic. So right away from this example, we should have known that we could rule out, say this, hopefully there's one we can rule out. I can rule out A and D right away, right? Because I know my test statistic has to be positive. I think if we keep it out to the third decimal, it's 1.867 or 1.866, you know, repeating. So that was our test statistic here. So let's just, so this is usually a point, like if, if you got that test statistic wrong, you're definitely going to get the p-value wrong, right? Because you're dealing with the wrong test statistic, okay? So let's think about if I use the p-value or the critical value approach, what levels could I reject this test statistic of negative 2.3 at? So the first one I'm going to show you is uh, the critical value approach, because we kind of already did that, right? We have the critical values, okay? So I'm going to use these critical values. And I'm going to redraw this just so I have kind of give myself a little bit more, more room. And so it's just a little bit more clear since we're doing some other work there. So those critical values that I had for that standard normal distribution. So I had what, negative two point, uh, oh, what was this? Hold on. We had two tailed tests, right? So it's like, I think I'm rounding these to the second decimal, but same kind of rule would apply. So here I'm just kind of plotting all those critical values that we had before. The rejection regions, right, are gonna be kind of drawing those arrows in the tail. Right. And just as a reminder, this was the 10% significance level, 5%, and 1%, and then kind of the same kind of, it was pairs of critical values, so got those on the other side as well. Okay. So all I have to do if I have my critical values, excuse me, so if I was confident with those critical values, I'll take that assumed true test statistic of negative 2.3, and I'll plot that kind of, you know, wherever it would fall here. So negative 2.3 would be somewhere like right about here. So this was my Z statistic. So it's in my rejection region at the 10% level. It's in my rejection region at the 5% level, but it's not in that rejection region for the 1% significance level. So we would say that, you know, we can reject with 10 and 5% confidence, but not 1%. Or sorry, not confidence, uh, significance. Any questions on, on kind of that approach? Okay. Give me a little bit of time if you're still kind of writing anything down from that. Um, so that's my test statistic. What if instead I wanted to use the p-value approach? So what I'm really doing there, I'm just gonna get rid of that so I can write above it here for a second. I'm just putting these on a different kind of graph, I guess, so it's easier to see. So if I found that same test statistic of negative 2.3, my p-value is the probability and I saw something that far away from the assumed true value or anything even further that went against the null. Well, the problem is for a two-tailed test, 
if I would have set, seen something equally as far away from that assumed true value, and the assumed true value is right, kind of our mean, it was equally as likely for me to see something that was above that assumed true value that also goes against the mean. With a one-tailed test, we don't have to worry about the other side because values on the other side actually support the null, but here we do. And so really my p-value, since the definition is the probability that I saw sample evidence that went against the assumed true value as far away as I did, or even further, that goes against the null. And now I have to think about my p-value is really the total area here. So each tail would really only be half of my p-value. So once I find the area in one of those tails, to get my total p-value, I would need to multiply it by 2. So I've got my test statistic of negative 2.3. I want the area to the left of it. Well, I can use the Z tables to do that, right? So I look up that Z value of negative 1.3, not negative, no, sorry. Um, it was 2.3, wasn't it? Negative 2.30, that's that first column. So 0 0.0107, right? So the area, here is 0 0.0107, which means since it's a symmetric distribution, the area over here is 0 0.0107. If you want to, you could add those two up or since they're the same value, multiply by two to get the total p-value, so 0 0.0214, right? Now, if I think about what levels, I'm just gonna erase this side down here for a second. What levels can I reject at if I did the p-value approach? Well, we always reject the p-values less than alpha. So my p-value is 0 0.0214. Is that less than 0.1? Yes, so I reject. Is it less than 0 0.05? Yes, so I reject. Is it less than 0 0.01? No, so I would fail to reject, which is the exact same decision we made using the critical value approach. Right? So on that one, you didn't have to like show how you got the rejection decision. So you really could have used either one of those, right? And they both lead you to the same answers, right? We can only reject at the five and 10% levels, okay? Also, one thing I wanna mention here, you know, like I already said, you know, if you had the wrong test statistic, you might get this answer wrong too. So when I give these assumed true values, don't read into them like at all. <laughs> um, don't say, well, this is negative 2.3. It's closer to this. So I, you know, this is probably the answer to 18. No, I'm choosing these for way, very different reasons and nothing related to kind of what the actual test statistic is, okay? Um, let's see another one. So we worked through kind of 14 through 19 here. I'm gonna add in an additional kind of discussion here at the end, just to... So this isn't on the practice exam, but it's a good question to know how to answer. And I wrote the exam, so that's probably want to listen to me on that one. So if we have this equation for our test statistic, uh, so I'll write this up here real quick. This is the one that we were dealing with. And let's think about from that last problem, we had the assumed true value of 109. No, sorry. We had the uh, assumed true value of 105 and we found 109. Okay. Just for the sake of this example, let's make it a little bit easier. Let's just do a right tail test. So let's say like this area would have represented our p-value for a right tail test, okay? Let's say instead of 49 Ball State students, I had looked at, I don't know, 100, right? So I have a higher sample size. What's that going to do to kind of this denominator? So the denominator is gonna get smaller. Remember, that denominator represented the standard deviation of my sample mean. So this is gonna get smaller. This denominator is gonna get smaller. 
So what that's really saying is my distribution of my sample means is getting more peaked. A lower variance or a lower standard deviation means it's kind of getting more peaked, right? So now if I think about the same sample evidence, now my p-value, much smaller, right? So my p-value is going to be much smaller when I have these higher sample sizes. Kind of the intermediate step there, we can also think about this is, well, if my denominator here is getting smaller, what's happening to my test statistic? Well, if I'm dividing by a smaller value, my test statistic is actually going up, right? Because when the standard deviation is smaller, seeing that same value is now more standard deviations away, which is what our test statistic represents. So I can also think about when I'm looking at my test statistic before, maybe it would have been right here. Now it's going to be somewhere out here. And when I go to look up the area to the right of it, same kind of idea has a smaller p value. Right? But you can kind of think about it either from the original normal distribution or think about it from that standard normal distribution point. So higher sample size reduces the variance in our sample mean distribution. So seeing the same evidence, you know, seeing that same value of 109, we'd have a higher test statistic and a lower p-value. Which, if the p-value is smaller, is it more or less likely we reject the null? Well, if we reject when the p-value is less than alpha, if the p-value is getting smaller, it's going to be more likely that it's less than a certain value, right? It's going from, you know, I don't know, 0 0.1 to, to 0 0.05, right? Or whatever the values would be. When we have a smaller p-value, it's more likely we can reject. So that's more likely to reject here. Right? So I can ask you a question on the exam, something like that. Like it's if I took a higher sample size, which of the following is true? Right? And it'd be like different combinations of, oh, test statistic is higher or lower, p-value is higher or lower, you're more or less likely to reject. Okay? I think the other practice exam has a, actually I know it has a, a 